first of all, thank you very much to all the organizers for this wonderful session. I think there are uh, many, many ideas that um, are developing right now. And especially I want to thank uh, Martin Callanan for his uh, first notes this morning, which forced me to uh, uh, slightly change the end of my presentation today in order to focus on some uh, anthropological aspects, which I think are uh, really relevant to our discourse. Um, in the natural context of the valley, starting uh, uh, from 1st century BC, we are in the central Italy, especially in the Abruzzi region, um, several places of worship uh, are built. In the, this short contribution, we decided to present them by a broad chronological division, pre-Roman and Roman together, and then post-classical sites. The, the two sets are internally coherent, and without fo focusing here too much on the single differences, it is possible to evaluate continuity and discontinuity phenomena in a diachronic perspective. And also to understand if the mountain natural context played a role in the exploitation of these sacred sites. From a geomorphological point of view, the Pelinia Valley is strongly conditioned by its high relief of the central Apennines and by the water landscape created by the river, as you can see clearly in the slide. The Aterno River, which is this one, through the gorges of San Venanzio, which are here, uh, guaranteed access to the Subequano Basin and to the Superecum, which in this turn allowed the passage to the Fucino Basin. The same area is then connected to the territory of Vestini Cismontani, heading to the north. The same river Aterno, having crossed the valley to the north here, at the height of the Valley of Popoli, receive, receives the waters of Sagittarius and Tirino and heads toward the Adriatic Sea, passing through the ancient territory of the Marrucini toward the port of Ostia Terni, so toward the Adriatic coast. Um, the Gizio River, instead, which originated in the territory from the present municipality of Pettorano, was the main link between the area of Corfinio and Sulmo. Corfinio and Sulmo were the two main Roman towns here on the valley. A secondary route split from this principal itinerary and was mainly used at Piedmont Road, running around the slopes of Mount Morrone, which is here, bearing sacred connotation linked to the cult of the waters, highlighted in its particular by this direct connection with the sanctuaries of Sant'Ippolito in Corfinium and of Ercole Curino in Sulmona, and we'll see it briefly. This set of mountain trails, roads, and sheep tracks followed the natural course of the crest and valley running from northwest to southeast, also guaranteeing a numerous connection with the coast thanks to the course of the river. One of the main sections of the road system precisely crossed the Pelinia Valley. The main uh, road here, uh, you can see cross all the valley, here towards Rome and here towards the Adriatic Sea. It's a very strategic place and was uh, crucial in the expansion of Rome toward east because it represented at the time, the 4th and the 3rd century BC, the main passage of the um, Apennine Mountains from uh, uh, the Tyrrhenic side from Rome toward the east coast. In his approach to minor settlements, Capogrossi Colognesi highlighted the specific characters of the central Italic area, both in terms of geomorphological and cultural context. Specifically, Abruzzi are articulated in high mountains, hills divided by deep valleys, and a coastal area, thus leading to different ways of exploiting the landscape and consequently different ways of inhabiting the landscape itself. From the fourth century BC, many, for many different reasons, led the local Piceni and Sanites population to divide into several smaller groups with different behaviors of, of course, towards Rome. Without entering into detail on the identity definition of these groups, especially in the second and the first century BC, while being almost fully Romanized and integrated, they kept the awareness of being something else from Rome. Inhabitating mountain areas probably contributed, uh, in this case, to this diversity, as in the Roman mentality of the first century BC and early empire, they were perceived um, often as hard to live in, 
culturally inadequated, but economically necessary as integrated in the most fundamental productive chain, the wood, the wool, the leather, and of course, metal and stone. In this um, context, uh, uh, as I said, many uh, sacred wor worship places were found and built. It is the case of Capo Pescara, where a sanctuary related to the source of Pescara River is associated with sparse settlement and necropolis, which is up here. The area was also strategic to the control of the river cross and the passage that led toward the coast, uh, or to the Adriatic coast to the east. A similar situation can be found in Vitorito. Here the sanctuary is located south of the settlement in an elevated position on a platform on the hill and with a full visual control on the area below and on the course of the river Aterno. Traces of first settlement and burial areas have been found not far from each other in the town of San Biagio, the Fontuccia, San Maurizio and Collevitare, which is all the area here. In this case, we find the same recurrent elements, sanctuary, settlement, and funerary areas, all together. Water was, as we mentioned, an important element in the management of resources. Many of the sanctuaries of the valley were related to water sources, Capo Pescara, as we mentioned, but of course also Fonte Sant'Ippolito, which is the number 51 here, and you can see the terrace building of the sanctuary here, and uh, we will come back to this uh, special site. Um, we have evidence of that in the position and the role of the sanctuaries in pre-Roman and Roman time, and the significant presence also of elements linked to the collection and channeling of water. There are a lot of tanks, cisterns, found in large, in large numbers in the surveys made by Frank van Vontergem in 1984, and also in the alignment of the centurization to the water channels, to the natural water channels that come from the mountain slopes toward the river valley. In the full imperial ages, the sanctuaries lose uh, part of their social political role and they are limited, we can say, um, to their religious service. However, many of them kept their landmark function and will be later recovered and reused with the propagation of the Christian cult. Um, I forgot to mention that the main uh, sanctuary, sanctuaries, which are Fonte Sant'Ippolito, the number 51, and uh, the sanctuary of Ercole Curino, which is number 140, um, are cult attested toward Ercole, as you um, may imagine by the name Ercole Curino. Many uh, statues of Hercules are found all the way in all these sanctuaries. And the presence of Hercules here is strongly connected both with the uh, um, water management cults and also with the shepherd's uh, uh, roots, the tratturi, which link the, the central part of the, sorry, um, the central part of the Apennines uh, toward the plains of Apulia, where the shepherds were brought uh, where the, um, and where the markets were held. All these sanctuaries are connected by uh, my, uh, minority roads toward the main roads that cross the valley and linked to the southern part of Italy as well. For what concerns the post-classical evidence, we can highlight two different cases. Uh, one where is the cultural continuity, so the, um, the same area is uh, reused reuse in post-classical times uh, for a Christian cult, and two main uh, examples are uh, San Venanzio, the, the goals of San Venanzio and Sant'Ippolito itself. San Venanzio is here, and then here is Sant'Ippolito, Fonte Sant'Ippolito. In the first case, in the San Venanzio, um, near the church have been in, uh, found some elements that belonged to a um, pagan sanctuary, a uh, fragment of columns, inscriptions, and so on and near this spot, the church, the Christian church was built. In the case of Sant'Ippolito, as you can see here from the slide, um, the, the material traces of the Christian um, structure, the Christian building, are very poor. Uh, it is, uh, there are some negative traces here, and it's very uh, near to the um, major 
pagan sanctuary and the natural source of water, which is, these are the bath, the, the, the channels, the water up from the mountain. And while we don't have a, a strict datation, a strict chronology for the Christian uh, building, uh, there are some interesting elements. For example, the dedication to Hippolito, it's a, a Roman martyr, martyr from the fourth century AD, and it's usually connected to the water management, to water sources. So the, um, it's one of the earlier attestation of uh, um, Hippolyto, of Saint Hippolyto, so maybe it can be dated around uh, the fourth of the beginning of the fifth century AD. The second type of uh, post-classical uh, um, buildings is the one that uh, overlays effectively with the uh, pagan buildings. So, for example, in the case of San Michele Arcangelo, we have the church uh, built directly on the previous pagan sanctuary, reusing some of the materials of the block in the basement and then building up the church. And as you can see, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's in a very panoramic position which dominates the valley, the river valley down there. Um, generally speaking, uh, there are some uh, constant uh, re uh, related to the uh, cultural continuity, which are, uh, of course, the uh, link to the uh, mobility roads to the uh, axis that uh, um, cross the valleys. And there are some um, geomorphological uh, interesting uh, deductions that can be made. Uh, in pre-Roman age, mountains were directly considered as sacred spaces as well as strategic assets for defensive purpose, of course, or for control of the territory. The importance as visible land landmarks sorry, uh, must not underestimate it as well. In fact, the ridges, open slopes, and stream terraces were exploited for their worship structures. In post-classical times, there seemed to be a differentiation between sites that control the landscape for example, Ponte Sant'Ippolito, um, which are continued in the open slopes and easiest, uh, easy reachable places, and in, instead uh, um, uh, harder to reach places like hermits, which are placed, of course, in more vertical slopes and ridges. Um, I wanted to uh, also um, highlight how there are some interesting anthropological uh, continuation of the cults. For example, in Fonte Sant'Ippolito, people still nowadays, at the, um, at the I, I think at the half of August, goes to the water source and put some of um, a little bit of water in their ears. So studies were made on the nature of the waters and enriched in therapeutic uh, substances. So pro that was probably what originated the, the cults of uh, uh, Hercules because of the management of water and what uh, uh, Hippolyto reused uh, as attestation in the, man in the management of water itself. And the interesting thing is that the, the day um, the, um, the people uh, participate to this procession, to this uh, um, walking to the, to the sanctuary, is the same day that in ancient time was dedicated to Hercules itself. So there is a full continuity both in the um, worship and in the um, how can I say, in the uh, ritual activities that take place in this area. And the same thing happened, for example, in San Michel Arcangelo, where there is this magic rock along the river where people should be uh, laid in order to be healed. And in, um, um, in the uh, sanctuary of Monte Playa, which is the, um, the highest sanctuary here, um, there is a, a, a great terrace where people go on the midnight of the solstice to see the sun rise. Around all the terrace, um, ex voto from uh, animal parts and human parts were found, and people still go there nowadays still to see the sun rise. Um, from our short presentation, I think some elements uh, seem to emerge that can answer our research question. So what are the agencies of the sacred topographies during a specific chronological phase 
In the pre-Roman phase, we saw the major agency operating is linked to a strong identity claim by the Italic population, and the need to have landmark points that can be easily recognized for a sparse settlement area. And uh, um, the features that affect continuity of discontinuity of those places in the post-classical times are, of course, the geomorphological position, the topographic strategy position for the control of sites, or the isolation of those sites in case of hermits of uh, different kind of cults. And the exploitation of lateral and natural landmarks and resources, water, mountain goals, panoramic views, the proximity to mobility routes, explain how this relationship with human and natural geographies work in this area. Finally, all these components work with each other in the construction of historical landscape by, and how this is also uh, well explained by the um, anthropological residuality, we can say, that signal how human agency use these places even when the sociocultural uh, context in which these places are born is already vanished. Thank you very much.